Ladies and gentlemen, can we ask the members of the press to wrap up their work? <laughs> Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Prime Minister, Your Excellencies, Ministers, distinguished guests, 
members of the international organizations, colleagues from the media. Welcome to the fourth Southeastern Europe Democracy Summit. My name is Yasmina Kos. I'm a journalist at Al Jazeera Balkans, and it is a pleasure to welcome you all present here and online across the world. Um, on behalf of the, of course, International Republican Institute. This annual summit is a flagship event of their Western Balkans regional program. And this definitely is the place, and this certainly is the time to talk about all the pressing, well, not depressing, but the pressing issues in the region, especially regarding seeking security in a year of uncertainty and building democratic resilience in the Western Balkans. We will open this conference with a welcome speech by US Senator Mitt Romney and Senior Policy Advisor to the Secretary of State, Derek Scholle. They sent a video message.
Now, before we start with the keynote speakers, a quick run through the agenda. Today, we have a conversation with the president-elect of uh, Montenegro and two panel discussions on emerging cracks in Euro-Atlantic consensus in the Western Balkans and turning the tide on dirty money. Tomorrow, one more interesting panel discussion on breaking the wall of corruption in the Western Balkans. A lot of interesting and important topics and questions to discuss and answer. So we have a full agenda and full day of discussions ahead of us. Um, I will use this opportunity to ask you to give a warm welcome to our first keynote speaker, Vice President of the International Republican Institute, Scott Mestic. Good morning. Welcome to the Southeastern Europe Democracy Summit. I'm Scott Mastic. I'm Vice President for Programs at the International Republican Institute. It is a great pleasure to return to Montenegro to host CDEM for the fourth consecutive year. IRI began this conference in 2020 with the vision that making democratic progress in the Western Balkans means creating a space for dialogue between stakeholders at all levels activists in government, civil society, the private sector, bringing them together as they share a common interest in the vitality of institutions, the rule of law, and freedom from corrupt practices. This summit fosters an environment of cooperation among those with both the knowledge and ability to make that progress through issue-based action at every level of government. To begin, allow me to extend a special welcome to our honored guests, who will open the conference. We are excited to have here with us Prime Minister of Montenegro, Drayton Abazovic, and U.S. Ambassador to Montenegro, Judy Renke, for this year's summit. I also want to acknowledge and thank the National Endowment for Democracy for continuing to fund this important regional initiative. This program would not be possible without Ned's support. And we are pleased to be joined by Ned's Senior Director for Europe, Asia Ivancheva. Thank you, Asia, for your enduring support for this program and for all that you do at NED to uphold and advance democracy throughout Europe and Eurasia. We are here today because we cannot ignore the challenges that stand in the way of democratic development in the Western Balkans. It is crucial that we remain vigilant against external actors who seek to undermine democratic institutions, manipulate public opinion, and sow division. Moreover, as you will certainly hear throughout this summit, foreign authoritarian actors have emboldened and financed corrupt political leaders in the region, deterring private foreign investment and restricting open and fair economic opportunities. As the region copes with multiple simultaneous challenges, forums that promote unity among democratic decision makers, civil society, and the media are critical to pushing back against illiberal foreign activities. In this regard, IRI will continue working together with our partners to support decision makers, political and civic leaders who are promoting government transparency and exposing corrupt practices. As you can see from the title of this year's event, Seeking Security, in a year of uncertainty, the summit will focus on the instability and unpredictability that Europe has faced in the past year. During expert-led panel discussions, we will hear from key thought leaders on the rapidly changing political and security dynamics in the Western Balkans and how these dynamics are affected by the increase of dark money entering the region. Panelists will also discuss the challenges facing the Euro-Atlantic relationship and how a stronger transatlantic bond can help break the cycle of corruption in the region. Through IRI's ongoing regional program, we have developed a task force to address many of these threats. The Western Balkans Task Force on Threats to Democracy brings together scholars, journalists, and policymakers who work together to address regional challenges through policy action. Since 2016, they have been working to
to confront a wide range of issues, from malign foreign influence to corruption to countering violent extremism. IRI's task force continues to grow and serve as a dynamic forum for regional discussions among pro-democratic actors and policymakers who seek to improve the region's democratic future. Welcome to all of our task force members who are here with us at CDEM. Also joining us today are members from all five chapters of IRI's Advanced Leadership in Politics Institute, or as it is known throughout IRI, ALPI. Since its inception six years ago, ALPI has become a leading program for young leaders in the region. Through this initiative, IRI works with rising political leaders, empowering them to collaborate across party, ethnic, and national lines to advance common policy goals. We are pleased to welcome our ALPI leaders at this year's summit. Finally, I want to thank the officials and representatives from our host country, Montenegro. We are honored to be here today after a critical election in this country, which represents a peaceful democratic transition of power and a positive direction for the country. As an important link in the transatlantic relationship, we look with hope as Montenegro moves into a future that increasingly looks more peaceful, prosper prosperous, and internationally engaged. This country plays a crucial role in maintaining stability in the Western Balkans and is a key factor in NATO's strength in the Adriatic. Montenegro's commitment to democratic progress reinforces security in the region and signals that the Euro-Atlantic consensus in the Balkans remains strong. IRI is excited to have opened an office here in Montenegro in the last year, launching programs on strengthening political party capacities, cross-party collaboration, and enhancing good governance through open government partnerships. We are proud to be working closely with our Montenegrin partners as we foster collaboration between national and municipal level government and elevate the voices of women and youth in party politics. I also want to take this opportunity to thank IRI's wonderful team from Sarajevo, Borisov Spasovic. I got that wrong, I think. <laughs> and Amelia Kracic, who have done amazing work to make this event possible. Thank you, Borko and Amelia, for all that you do and for your leadership in organizing this important event. And now, it is my distinct honor to welcome to the stage the U.S. Ambassador to Montenegro, Judy Ranke. Ambassador Ranke has extensive diplomatic experience, having served in India, the Philippines, Thailand, Indonesia, Germany, and Switzerland. In her current position, she is doing much to advance cooperation between Montenegro and the United States, particularly in strengthening our partnership within NATO. The United States is fortunate to have her as one of our key diplomats in the world, and Montenegro is fortunate to have her here as the U.S. Ambassador. Welcome, Ambassador Ranke. Please take the stage. Thank you, Scott. That was something. Dobre jutro. Good morning. Uh, nice to see you all here. Um, it is truly my distinct honor to be invited again by our friends, our, our dear friends from the International Republican Institute, IRI, to address you today at the CDEM conference. Uh, Prime Minister, ministers, uh, uh, excellencies, um, academics, thinkers, politicians, media, friends. So when I look at this group, I see friends in the audience. Thank you for being here. It's not the organizers I thank, it's you, those of you committed to the same principles that I'm going to be discussing today, that is building democratic resilience, particularly with a focus on strengthening the institutions that keep our democracies strong. So thank you for being here. We're gathering today to discuss democratic resilience 
on the eve of parliamentary elections in Montenegro. Now they're currently scheduled for June 11th, just about a month from now. These elections are going to mark yet one more important development in Montenegro's democracy, which, let me be honest, has had its ups and downs since this country uh, achieved its independence in 2006. The course of developments here has broadly tracked the region as a whole. Um, that is, people are trying so hard to turn away from years of divisive rhetoric, war, bloodshed. They're seeking to live in peace, build prosperity, and align their values and their institutions with Europe, including seeking eventually to join as true members of the European Union, where every country in this region belongs. It's a goal held not just by Montenegrins, but the entire region. And while we may not always feel that enough progress is being made towards the goal here in Montenegro, where I have to admit I have my uh, responsibilities, let's put it in focus. That is, this goal is all the more important in light of what we see here in Europe, that is Russia's brutal aggression against Ukraine, where Russians artillery and missiles regularly kill innocent Ukrainian citizens. And it reminds us every day why we should not lose sight of the value of the goal of being part of Europe, because regrettably, we must never forget men's ability, and that's women's ability, to inflict violence on others. The senseless destruction and loss of that that's taking place in that conflict stands in direct con contrast to what we're trying to do here. It's why we're gathered here. It's to defend democracy itself and the values and institutions that define it. That's the critical backdrop of why we gather here to discuss security and why democracy needs to be made even more resilient for Montenegrins and for all their neighbors. And as Derek Chalet and even Mitt Romney made reference, we're seeking something concrete and real that is a Europe whole, free, prosperous, and at peace. It's why we continue to take care of democracy, to cherish it, and to fight for it. So I am an American, and I'm proud to say those words, because for me, democracy is rooted in what we refer to as the American dream. It's a concept that with hard work and with merit, one can carve out a dignified and meaningful life with education and opportunities for your children, and with freedom to be who you want to be. That's the American dream. And I know there's a Montenegrin dream, and I know there's a dream for every member of the Western Balkans. I've seen it in the aspirations of young students I've talked to in Plevla and Setenia. I've seen it among the defenders of human rights who speak truth to power at fear of political retribution. I've seen it in the words of investigative daring journalists who risk their lives to pen truths. And I've seen it in the candid and private discussions that ambassadors are often able to have with your leaders when the doors are closed and when the media is out of the room because the dream is there. Americans do not have a monopoly on the concept of dreaming. The Montenegrin dream is out there, and it all starts with democracy. While some may say that democracy is an ideal, an abstract, as an American, I would argue that the essence is in the institutions that bring the ideal to life. In fact, this was um, known to the founders of my country when they, they wrote the Constitution in 1787. It is precisely the institutions where strength and resilience that we need uh, to protect it uh, must exist and how we can support democracy. So I'll talk a minute about institutions. So let me be clear what I mean when I say institutions. I'm not talking about a tool for politicians to create jobs and win votes. And I'm not talking about an institute of power to exert uh, effort and bend the will of, of partisan politics. That's not what an institution is. I mean really boring institutions 
independent bodies equipped with procedures, enshrined in constitutions, protected by transparent rules that are handed down and performed by professional civil servants committed to the government working for the people. By the way, that's what we mean when we say rule of law. It's not an abstract, it's the daily work of governance. And that's why rule of law is so critical to democracy. The ends do not justify the means. A democracy must follow its own rules or it will lose legitimacy in the eyes of its own people. And I will say in the eyes of the international community. Law and rules should not be changed to suit the whims of political interests or political parties or individuals. This is not a trend unique to Montenegro or to this region. We see it way too often. And when corruption takes root in these institutions, they grow weak, making the governments vulnerable to foreign influence and ultimately failure. Let me quote my own president. President Biden said, corruption is a cancer within the body of societies, a disease that eats at trust public trust in the ability of governments to deliver for their citizen, citizens. It stunts the growth, growth of economies. It undermines your children's dreams. It intimidates investors. In Montenegro, I will say we must applaud the courageous leaders who confront endemic corruption here because that could undermine the hard-won, hard-fought democracy you've built. They are the heroes to citizens that they serve, and citizens also expect those leaders to be even-handed in their struggle with corruption, not to use it as a mere slogan in a political battle against partisan adversaries, but to truly fight the corrupt influences that are under the surface. In any democracy, we must remember, it is the people who have the power. We the people, that's enshrined in the preamble of my, my uh, constitution, and to turn that principle into practice, we must entrust, that is trust, our elected officials to represent us and make decisions on our behalf. But when those institutions are weakened or undermined, the people start to lose trust in the ability to hold their representatives accountable. And we've seen it. That can quickly become a threat to democracy and we must work to prevent it from happening. Let me turn to economic prosperity. Because if you have a working government, then the citizens have one primary goal, and that is their future. Economic prosperity is something that citizens in every country demand their governments deliver. And Montenegro is no exception. To provide that prosperity, governments inevitably seek the advice of experts. Experts who can improve the investment climate, experts who can build new infrastructure and can spur development and create new jobs. And that's a good thing if such advice is balanced, excuse me, and the, and the impact of the resulting development brings broad-based prosperity. However, let me add a word of caution here. We cannot just listen to individual experts at the expense of other voices, like labor unions like community groups and others. Let me not forget others, which would include listening to the people. This approach is sometimes considered somewhat populist, but I disagree. It's strictly common sense. The voices of all citizens, those that vote for you and those that oppose you are important. And so leaders must work together to create a society that is fair, just, sustainable for all. To be clear, I am painting a picture here that is somewhat idealized, but it's, it's crucial to recognize that the democratic institutions themselves aren't perfect. They're not themselves, uh, by their nature, immune to flaws that could allow narrow interests to capture them over time, or from other challenges that we face as a society, like corruption and malign influence. But they provide, that is, the institutions provide the means for the peaceful operation of governments and the peaceful transfer of power. They're the bedrock, and they help to ensure that a broad range of voices are heard, which is particularly important in this region and in a country like Montenegro, where multicultural voices need to rise to the surface. So finally, let me end with a personal set of anecdotes 
um, that I think may, may help you understand my perspective on Montenegro and, and to the region at large. At the end of last year, the country found itself on the verge of a constitutional crisis. Now, for months, the Constitutional Court of Montenegro had been dysfunctional, as Parliament repeatedly fa failed to elect new judges, and the court itself lacked a quorum to even make decisions. I'll say the deadlock had trickled down to block other institutions at that point. Um, it prevented the resolution of a dispute between the parliament and the president over the formation of new government. It stopped the certification of valid electoral results in cities across the country, including in Podgorica. This was December. It seemed that every key democratic institution in the country was under assault, to me and to many others. And for several weeks, I have to tell you, and again, this is my personal anecdote, that I felt the future of democracy was at risk. I worried what this crisis was saying about the people and the leaders of this country. And to be frank, I sometimes would even question whether we shared the same democratic values. January was a busy month. There was a lot of work to do. But then in February, political leaders, particularly in parliament, found a way to elect three new judges and to restore a quorum in the court, a single act that began to slowly unblock the other democratic institutions in the country. Their focus is commendable. It started to restore my faith in your leaders and your belief in democracy. And then just over a month ago, I saw something equally important. In both rounds of Montenegro's presidential election, I was honored to be able to serve as an election monitor and observer and I witnessed grassroots democracy in action. I saw citizens from different parties working together, shoulder to shoulder, managing the polling stations in harmony, ensuring that everyone had a voice in free and fair elections. Let me be clear, these were from all political parties, all sit sitting together, allowing every citizen to vote. These common citizens inspired me um, and they had volunteered their time to ensure the resilience of the country's voting systems, which I think are one of the basic democratic institutions that protect democracy as a whole. I can see how much individual Montenegrin citizens value, res respect, and protect their democracy. Now, I know the Constitutional Court is still not complete. I know election processes are not perfect. In fact, I've had a chance to review the OSCE's oh dear long list of re recommendations for reforms, which show that there's a lot of work ahead. But I urge the new parliament, whichever, which will emerge out of uh, the uh, coming elections in June, to be serious about electoral reforms and to get going on completing the constitutional court. Because seeing the individual dedication of everyday Montenegrins to democracy gives me hope of the country's institutions and that they can work effectively. And it gives me hope that citizens and leaders can work together and collaborate. And it gives me hope that the Montenegrin dream can be achieved. And it gives me hope that a reformed democratic Montenegro will achieve the aspirations of the citizens to finally join the European Union. So thank you very much for your attention today and for every one of you, for your contributions to building a stronger, more open, more resilient democracy in the Western Balkans. Please be assured that on this journey, the United States continues to stand with you so that you can achieve that vi vision and that secure future for your children. Thank you. Thank you again, Your Excellency, for painting the picture, as you said, and for your strong messages. For the second time, as we already mentioned, Montenegro is hosting the Southeastern uh, Europe Democracy Summit. So thank you again for your welcome and for your support. Allow me to invite the Prime Minister of Montenegro, Mr. Dritan Abazovic, to join me here and to address us next. Your 10 minutes are up. Thank you very much. Good morning. Dobar dan svima, Mirdita. So, first of all, great pleasure and thank you very much for the invitation and thank you very much 
because you choose Budva and Montenegro to organize see them again. Dear Excellencies, dear Ambassadors, these ministers who are coming from the region, dear MPs from Montenegro and from the region, dear friends from Europe, dear friends from US, dear guests, dear representative of media, dear representative of NGOs, it's a great pleasure to have possibility again in Montenegro to discuss important topics, not only for our country, but for Southeastern Europe. And uh, it's right, everything what we heard until now, and everything what we heard in many of conferences which I, 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 I organized in many countries in the, in the region, that uh, we have some challenges which finally, I think, we need to find a solution how to fix it. The one of the key problems which I want to underline and to repeat my thesis for the Western Balkans is corruption. I think that behind of nationalism in Western Balkans is corruption. And I think with fighting against corruption, with the less corruption, we will have less nationalism, more professional institution, more reconciliation, more mobility, more justice, and in the end of the day, much better living standards and much better environment in every aspect. But it's very hard to fight against corruption in these countries because of many reasons. One of the reasons is that uh, elites who are for many years on the power, they really don't want to promote new values. They feel comfortable in this kind of environment. They are all interested to have weak institution. They are all interested to don't have any kind of progress. Only people who have direct financial interest, they don't want to move on. They don't want to go on in the context of the country. They don't want the progress. They want to keep status quo. And to keep status quo, you need to tell something to the people. And to the people, you always talk the old stories, stories from the past. We cannot change the past. Only what we can change is the future. We can discuss about past. We should say true about the past, but we only can change the future. The same approach, we cannot change the future. And this is important, and I am very glad to have possibility to open this conference in the context to be one of the speakers. And I am more than sure that everybody will give contribution to put the focus on fighting against corruption and organized crime. These two things are going together. Institutions are weak because in Montenegro, in the region, it's a little bit different, but not too much different in context of phenomena. It's because we have the political monopoles. Yeah. Destroying of political monopoles, making possible to every citizen to think that everybody is important. Like people who elect, like people who have the right to vote, to have the right to choose, everybody is important. That's democracy. When people don't have the hope that they can change something, they don't believe in the true values. Then don't believe that we become, can become the next, next uh, state, uh, uh, country who will be next in the in full membership of, of EU. Now, I think that everywhere in the region, without, uh, I don't want to underestimate every different kind of challenges what we had, I think that people day by day more and more believe that they can change something more and more believe that they can change something. For that, we need the institution, professional institution, but institution which can make the decisions. Unfortunately, in Montenegro, we still don't have every institution which can make decisions. Our, our dear ambassador of US, uh, Judy, mentioned Constitutional Court. Constitutional Court now have the quorum, but still don't have enough will to make a decision which is really unbelievable. In January, we have the situation we don't have constitutional court and they don't have possibility to make a decision. Now they have enough, they have quorum, they have possibility to make decision, but they are still in some kind of, uh, some kind of uncomfortability to make that. Things need to be changed. 
Fighting against organized crime corruption is the crucial for every single Western Balkan country. I am really proud what Montenegrin government did in the last two and a half years. It's not existing organized criminal group which is not attacking Montenegro. Of course, we cannot be a country which can uh, finish with all uh, criminal activities or corruption inside the country because that is impossible for the, for the much better organized countries. But what is important? To show the will. What is important? To show the will. To explain in every single example, to show that nobody is above the law and nobody is untouchable. It doesn't matter is the prosecutor, judges, politician, people from, from business community, everybody should have the equal rights, but also everybody needs to know that can be responsible if make something against the, against, against the law. Money laundering, this is the key thing still don't have enough financial investigation in, in Montenegro. And it's true that somebody say, yes, it's a different kind of foreign, foreign uh, um, involvation, impact of, of the third countries. It is historical thing. But also we can say that the political relation with the Russia Federation in this moment, it's under the zero in Montenegro. And the influence, negative influence of Russia Federation in Montenegro, it's in historical minimum in this moment, today in Montenegro. It's in historical minimum. We never have this kind of situation before. And starting to making the different kind of financial investigation with show to the people, to our people, and I think the same will be in one moment in the region, that the people who are talking about protecting of the national interest and about big stories, they only talking that because they want to protect all the money and all the interest. Not interest of the people, not interest of the country. The interest of Montenegro, and this is the great opportunity to share with you, it's to have the perfect regional cooperation. We want to create open society. We don't think that that is the weakness of this country, but the opportunity of this country. We need to, 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 to do more in the promotion of the infrastructure common infrastructure project with every country in the neighborhood. We want to make easy access to the people, more safety, more security, and more promoting of the good businesses. This is the way how we can make the reconciliation. This is the way how all Western Balkan can send positive vibration and positive news everywhere in the, in the, in the Europe. And this is the way how we can understand that we not, should not stay just like uh, like uh, countries who always in the neighborhood looking for the some enemy but everywhere in the neighborhood also in european union and around the world looking for the friends friendship and cooperation our interest to don't have the negative influence from the third side it's to have more positive impact from eu also from us this is the choice of the, these people People of Montenegro want to be Western part of the world, want to share the values, not, not because of Brussels, not because of DC, but because of Podgorica, because of Budva, because of Plevlja. We want to make the system which provide the justice and people in Montenegro asking for the justice. This is what, it's not the question only for government, for this or for another. This is the question for the society for the judiciary system, which is really problematic in our country, for the prosecutor system, which is much better than before, but it's uh, still a lot of things what, what, what we need to do there. And of course, to have the institution like a parliament, like executive, which will work together for the goods of the, of the, of the people. I am pretty optimistic about Montenegro. Also, not like Montenegro, I am also optimistic for the region, Mm, it, they are some questions which are, it's not similar to, to, to look from our countries than from, from, from another's. And I'm always trying to, 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 to understand the different perspective and appreciate different, different perspective. But definitely, definitely, if we want, if we want to have common success, like a region, we need to change the approach. We need to fight corrupt 
politician. We need to promote more justice. And in that way, I think day by day, people will understand that this is most important interest for themselves and for their families. We have the uh, one research which was in Croatia, but I always repeat this because I think the similar situation is Montenegro, why young people want to move from the countries. There are two main reasons. First reason is that traditional reason for the for the economical benefit. So you have some better life condition, better salary somewhere else, and you want to move from the country. This is first thing. But second, second, immediately, just few percentage, uh, few percentage less is the corruption. It's because of corruption. This corruption is connected with the injustice. Young people seeing injustice. Injustice in political life, injustice in social life, injustice in the inside of some companies, some, some kind of organization. And this makes the frustration which motivate people to say, no, I don't want to live here, I want to live some, some, somewhere else. So maybe this economical rhythm we cannot change immediately. But promotion of justice and to give the opportunity to the young people to, 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 to feel important in northern country, I think that we can do in the in the in the some let's say not short but the middle middle in middle term to be like a middle middle term for all this region. In this context, I think we can keep people, and in one moment we can change this cycle in the way, in the way that people will want to come back in northern countries to see the future in northern countries. But before we're doing that, we need to have the professional and independent institution. This is hard work and it's connected with the lack of human resource, which I see everywhere, with the lack of trust, which also we can see everywhere. But nevertheless, if we finish the process like we finish after the new year, after the new year, like this last election, which was in Montenegro, like in the Western Europe, with a pretty relaxation and nobody cares about election. And I think that more or less the similar situation will be in the parliamentarian. Parliamentarian election is not because we have too much different political options or too much different mindset like before. It's be because only thing people don't have afraid anymore. They are not afraid anymore to have the truth. This is the reason. So I ask for the same concept to provide everywhere in the region to our friends from the neighborhood, which I know very well and understand very well and know, I think, pretty well what is the situation also in other countries. It's not easy, but we need the leadership who will have the different approach. This is not the question of generation. This is not the question of the age. This is the question that we need to promote the people who are not contaminated from the 90s. With the contamination, with the virus from the virus from the 90s, I think we will talk about the same topics next 20 years. But if we find the people and leadership, this is not connected with age, who don't have that kind of virus, I think that this region can be very successful, very successful, very unique, united in aspect of the, of the, of the, of the economy and promotion of values, and give some new value also, also to, your, to, to Europe. And to conclude, I truly believe that Montenegro is the perfect country to be next uh, country who will be in full membership of EU. I really, I re I really believe, believe that. I don't want now to, to spend the time to, to give the argument why, why I truly believe that this, the, the, we are perfect for that, but it doesn't matter. The message is we need to relive the enlargement process. After the situation what we have in Europe last year, we should understand that solidarity need to be one of the priority of foreign policy of EU. I hope that they will understand that and that that door will stay open for every country which have that kind of aspiration. Of course, we need to finish our homeworks, 
our challenges, our internal reforms, it's true, our conditions, but it's very important to keep that light uh, to be turned on and to people uh, believe that hope is there and the future is different from the past. In that, in that uh, name, I want to congratulate one more time the representative of the, of the, of the IRI. I want to congratulate everybody for, 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 for choosing Pudva and Montenegro. I want to invite you also informally to visit Montenegro during the touristic season, which will be a record season in, in, in our country, to have a nice time here and these two days to use for the good discussion and good conclusion, which will be very helpful for every country in South, Southeastern Europe. Thank you very much and welcome to Montenegro again. Thank you again to all our keynote speakers for your thoughts. It created a good starting point for the day of discussions ahead of us. Now it's time to start with the opening panel discussion. Um, I don't know I, if I understand correctly, Prime Minister has his responsibilities he needs to attend to. So one more round of applause and we will say goodbye to the Prime Minister before we continue with the panel. Okay, now um, the first panel discussion of the day is emerging cracks in Euro-Atlantic consensus in the Western Balkans. Allow me to introduce our esteemed panelists as I kindly ask you to join me here on stage. Um, and take a seat. This first one is mine, but you can choose from the, from the rest of them. <laughs> now, Minister of Internal Affairs and Public Administration of the Republic of Kosovo, Ajelja Svechja, please join us. He have steps here. A member of the House of Representatives of the Parliament of Bosnia and Herzegovina, Sasha Makazinovic, please join us. Senior Director for Europe, National Endowment for Democracy, Asia Ivancheva. <laughs> Permanent Fellow, Head of Europe's Futures, Ideas for Actions in Institute for Human Sciences, Mr. Ivan Vejvoda. <laughs> and our last panelist, Senior Fellow with the Atlantic Council's Europe Center, Maya Piščević. <laughs> okay, thank you for joining us. Um, I will join you also. This one is mine. <laughs> so, thank you again for joining us. You don't have to deal with the microphones. Our audio guys will, will take care of that. Allow me to set the scene. We have until 12.30 for this uh, panel. Uh, it is a very interesting topic, so I presume there will be questions from the audience right here and the ones that follow us uh, via Zoom. So we will leave enough time for the questions from the audience. Uh, listen carefully to what our panelists have to say and prepare your questions. Now, let's start with some key points. 51. 51. That's how many years combined the Western Balkan countries uh, have been in the EU candidate countries. North Macedonia the longest, more than 70 years, 17 years, and Bosnia and Herzegovina the shortest for the six months. Kosovo still has serious obstacles to get to the opportunity to be EU candidate country. But in all these years of efforts, did the EU's policies and US support bring about the expected change? Now, until a few years ago, the predominant question in the region was, is EU interested in the enlargement? And why not? On the other hand, the candidate countries didn't really rush to pass the test of reforms and to reverse the democratic backsliding. In 2020, EU's changes to the accession methodology raised hopes of pulling the Western Balkans in, well, at least for North Macedonia and later Albania. But it seems that a war was needed along with the tangible threats and examples of real uh, malign foreign influence to kind of jumpstart the process of Euro integration. That's how Bosnia and Herzegovina got the ticket. So was the fear or the real merit behind that decision is an open question. In 2023, what predictions for the Balkans have come true? 
Is there a real intention in the region to walk the mile, to go through all the reforms, or is it just about saying all the right things, but doing the bare minimum, or even bluntly going against EU's policies? Stability, along with peace and prosperity, are the Western priority in the Balkans. But is stability being rewarded at the expense of functional democracy? And is the US and EU support inadequate or unfocused? A lot of really important questions. Um, we will try to find an answer to some of them in our discussion. Now, uh, Minister uh, uh, Svechlia, if you don't mind, we will start with you. Uh, exactly 11 years ago, on this day, a Belgrade-Pristina dialogue started. Now, we had a lot of um, technical agreements. Then we had Brussels, Washington, and the latest Ohrid agreement. What can be done to ensure or to encourage both sides to fully implement the agreements? Uh, first of all, let me thank the organizers for organizing this event and for inviting us to be part of it. And of course, it's not easy to say something smart after keynote speakers, especially after the speech of Ambassador Judy. Uh, I'm really happy to be part of this, this panel and discuss all these very important topics. Uh, I strongly also believe that Kosovo plays a crucial role in the region, especially concerning the topics that were mentioned, like a rule of law path against organized crime and corruption. But also, we are convinced that uh, regional cooperation is a must, it's a crucial, so the region moves ahead into its aspirations uh, for integration. Now, uh, in this path, it's not that all members of six Balkan states are um, investing same or investing its maximum. Mm -hmm. uh, and as you said, during times, also organizations that we want to in be integrated don't have the linear will to move ahead sometimes because of uh, external uh, influence or internal politics they tend to be more willing and then less willing, which uh, of course is, uh, makes it difficult for, for us. Uh, what is the most important thing for me is that all societies uh, need to decide once and for all uh, which kind of system of values they want to nurture. Uh, sometimes uh, it's more easily to say declaratively, but it's very hard to implement this system of values. Uh, liberal democracy and uh, uh, integrative processes that uh, we aspire. I'm happy to say that uh, there is a national consensus in Kosovo concerning the integration in the EU. 95% of its citizens are very determined that uh, EU integration is a fate for Kosovo. Uh, absolutely, it should be a fate of the region also. Mm -hmm. And this integration uh, would be much uh, faster if all countries have the same aspirations or have the same priorities in these uh, integrative processes. Uh, all countries we face either internal challenges, uh, which is really deep reforms, and um, now we are talking about uh, rule of law, justice, but we need to talk about jobs, we need to talk about economic uh, development too. Uh, we, ha we have face security challenges, which sometimes are domestic, 
uh, very often are regional and we all are witnessing the problems that we face because of the lack of regional uh, welfare uh, security and long-term stability. Mm -hmm. I'm emphasizing long-term stability and of course influence of third factors mm -hmm. outside of the region that uh, have in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, we are happy, we are very happy with the influence a positive influence that EU, the United States, and other democratic countries have uh, in the region. Absolutely, we are unhappy and we are worried about a negative influence that uh, despotic countries have in the region, mm -hmm. sometimes uh, planned, sometimes by inertia, sometimes misusing our uh, lacks our failures, uh, very often uh, projecting their own interest into our, our uh, differences. We are very engaged into preserving peace and stability, uh, but also endorsing uh, democracy. Uh, we think, we, we, we strongly believe that only through this uh, we can have a promise mm -hmm. uh, that uh, societies uh, and individuals within these societies will fulfill uh, themselves. Um, yes, it's already 11 years that we are in a, in a pro negotiation process uh, in so many uh, kind of setups. Uh, unfortunately, sometimes the negotiation was per se, it was serving the negotiations, mm -hmm. but not serving the interests of uh, both countries, uh, each legitimate interests of citizens of both countries to move ahead with uh, democratic, nurturing democratic uh, values. Uh, we had several agreements. Now we have the last one, the agreement, mm -hmm. which needs to be implemented fast mm -hmm. and unconditionally. Is there a will to do so? Well, uh, from our side, uh, absolutely, there is a will mm -hmm. to do so. Unfortunately, uh, now it's also notified that the other side has already violated eight points out of 11 points of agreement. Uh, so we need to make sure that both sides, but not only both sides, also EU and uh, US and everybody from the democratic part of the world uh, does whatever we can do so this agreement succeeds, that we uh, start moving ahead with uh, much more important processes for both for both countries mm -hmm. democratization of countries uh, nurturing democratic values uh, fighting organized crime and corruption freedom of medias all this which as far as for kosovo part is already recognized uh, internationally by international organizations if I can just briefly go through through it, if I'm allowed, of course. So, uh, Kosovo is um, ranked amongst uh, leaders of the region, if not the leader of the region, a region for uh, rule of law, for example, or justice report, which mm -hmm. first and rule of law, transparency international index, improved our position for 20 places in, in two years. Mm -hmm. uh, we are the second best scoring country in the Western Balkans. We jumped 17 places on Press Freedom Index of Reporters Without Borders. Kosovo, Kosovo is ranked first in Europe and second globally for biggest improvement in rule of law in 2021. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm not saying that we are first or second in the world. We are far away to achieve that. We need much harder to work on for that. But for improvement, mm -hmm. we are second in the world. For a so a lot young of positive state, development. This mm -hmm. is a huge, huge, unbelievable achievement. Mm -hmm. And yes, as a government, we are extremely focused to continue with results like this to make them daily happen. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for now. Uh, we mentioned uh, a few percentages maybe to continue uh, in this sense. Mr. Vevoda, the majority of Serbian citizens uh, are against recognition of Kosovo's independence. Uh, 70 to 80 percent of them say no to the sanctions to Russia, according to the latest uh, polls. And a year ago, for the first time, more uh, of the Serbian citizens were against joining the EU than, to, uh, than in favor of joining it. How to insist on aligning with the EU policies, foreign and, and other policies, how to insist on reforms on, or on stre stre uh, strengthening the democracy, on uh, implementing European values when the support in the country is so low? Um, how seriously do you think is Serbia devoted to, to the Euro integration process? Thank you very much. And it's a real pleasure to be here with, with friends and colleagues of, of many years. Um, let me tell you a little story, I think, that explains some of these issues very well. I have a friend in Belgrade who lives in a high-rise in New Belgrade, and he is someone who's lived in Europe for a long time in Brussels. And in the building, there are pensioners, some my friend knows are pro-Russian, and taking the elevator down from a high floor, this pensioner asked my friend, whom he knows is in Europe, he said, what would you say is the best place to send my son uh, to do an MA? And this pro-Russian pensioner, when he heard my friend's answer, my friend said, well, to Moscow, of course. And the pensioner said, you're crazy. <laughs> so this is, I think, you know, it's a simple story, but it, it, it explains this confusion in the heads of people. We are a pro-Western society, thanks to Yugoslavia, a, a country that no longer exists, and, in which I was born, because we always traveled westwards. Uh, I will reveal my age by saying that I came of age when Czechoslovakia was invaded by the Soviet Union, and I served my military service on the Italian border of the Yugoslav army. We were fighting the Soviet Union then, because there was a real danger that the Soviets would attack. So I completely understand what the Ukrainians are doing, and I'm completely with them. So the brutal Russian invasion is a game changer for all of us. Now, why has Serbia not introduced sanctions? Frankly, as a citizen of that country, I'm very embarrassed by that fact. We are the only ones with Belarus who has, who has not done that. At the same time, Serbia is sending electrical engineers to Ukraine to help them repair the power grid. Unfortunately, we have experience with that from the NATO bombing, when these electrical engineers did a, a lot of work when the grid was bombed. We have Ukrainian refugees, we have Ukrainian wounded soldiers in our hospitals. And as you have seen as in some of the recent leaks, it says that Serbia is exporting also weapons and ammunition to uh, Ukraine. So the picture is, is mixed and opinion polls, however seriously we should take them, uh, one should take with a pinch of salt. Because if you ask someone in the street, do you think Kosovo should become independent? Of course, in the street, they will say, no, of course not, Kosovo is part of Serbia. You go to a cafe, you have a few drinks, and people will, I'm simplifying to sort of show what I mean. Uh, people say, well, of course we realize that Kosovo is independent. Uh, Serbia lost a war, it was defeated by NATO in, on June 10th, 1999, and the Serbian state left Kosovo. It is tied through resolution 1244 serbia has sovereignty through the un resolution 1244 and the question has always been how does one acknowledge that reality and solve this issue of the sovereignty at un resolution 1244 as you just yourself said the negotiations began under president tadic 11 years ago under kathy ashton uh, there was the agreement signed uh, in April uh, 10 years ago. And 
neither side has really fulfilled everything that's said there. Kosovo has not fulfilled the association, Serbia has not fulfilled the number of things. I asked European Union officials who work in Brussels, I said, do you guys keep a scorecard of who has done what? They said, yes, we, we keep one in our office. I said, you need to make it public so that we see who has done what and who has not done what. At the same time, when, for example, randomly taken, when Kosovo got its international phoning number, do you think there was any revolt in Belgrade? Nobody noticed that Kosovo got a phone number. Uh, when the Brussels agreement was signed, when Serbian police and the judiciary were put under the Republic of Kosovo constitution, nobody really reacted. The visa issue, the latest development, how did it go in Serbia? The, the visa liber liberalization, the, the latest. Uh, yeah. Everybody is very supportive. Yeah. Even our foreign minister has been saying it for two years. We have all been saying it. It's ludicrous that Kosovo doesn't have a visa free regime when Ukraine and Moldova and Venezuela yeah. have a visa free regime. I mean, this is crazy. This is a problem that we that we have with Europe now uh, because time is running out. Um, I think there, there's been a problem with complacency in the European Union. And I fully agree with what has been said by, by the ambassador and, and, uh, and uh, Prime Minister Abazovic. We've had ups and downs. We have not done our homework. I mean, Montenegro, that's a front runner, has opened every chapter, but during the Djukanovic era, closed temporarily only one. So, you know, you can keep opening things, but until you do your homework and start closing, you have an advance. In fact, North Macedonia. It's probably more advanced than both Serbia and, and Montenegro in that case. So I always say 95% of the homework is on us. It behooves us and our leaders to lead that change. And in my country, uh, actually, this sort of competitive authoritarianism has prevailed and uh, in democratic institutions have been eroded and not enough has been done on, on EU uh, democratic uh, and institutional reform. Now, I always say, and some of uh, people have heard me say this, if we had a referendum in all of our Western Balkan countries, next Sunday, we would have majorities of people who would say yes to joining the European Union, because common sense prevails in the silent majority. When you put a microphone under your nose or something like that, that does not happen. People have a great number of people of our region and Prime Minister Abazovic mentioned have joined the European Union individually. Vienna, where I live currently, is one of the biggest Serbian cities outside of Serbia. I mean, you walk in central Vienna, you only hear our language, yeah? And everyone in Serbia has someone in Sweden, France, Switzerland, Austria, Germany, because Portugal. Of the because of the elevator pitch. <laughs> because of the elevator pitch, so people know yeah. the reality of the European Union. And what I like to say is people will, will say yes to joining, notwithstanding what the opinion polls say, because they know it's a little more certain, it's a little more secure, and it's a little more prosperous, giving the chance. I'll, yeah. I'll conclude by saying, look, when Slovenia was supposed to join NATO, there was all this fuss, no, they will not have a majority, etc. On the day of the referendum, 60, I don't know, I can't remember, 5% voted yes. When Croatia had its referendum, there was all this, again, hullabaloo, you know, will we have enough votes? Especially the, the New Zealand and Australian uh, Croatians were saying, no, this is the worst thing we can do, the new Moscow and all this. They had a huge majority. It would be the same in Kosovo, in Serbia, in Bosnia, because, but give people a chance and don't confuse them with these kind of messages that we're hearing, mm -hmm. in particular in the case of Serbia. Thank you so much. Uh, so we mentioned Montenegro, uh, Ms. Ivancheva. Uh, I would like to continue with you, if that's okay. Um, Montenegro was praised until a few years ago as the front runner uh, of the West Western Balkans when it came to a uh, Euro integration process. Then at the crucial moment, it seems that instead of catching the geopolitical train to fast forward to EU, it kind of pulled the brakes and stopped even to the point of EU mentioning suspending the accession negotiations uh, in, in one moment. Uh, what are the long-term consequences of that? And do you see the latest developments in the country, the um, election of the new president and everything that is going on as a next step in democratic evolution of the country? Or do you see it as a continuation of instability that we see in the last two or three years? 
So thank you for this question. It's always a pleasure to talk to a moderator who's a journalist because they ask the right questions. And thank you to the International Republican Institute for the event and Montenegro for hosting it. Um, my, let me start with the um, second part of your question um, in terms of the election um, and its desired consequences. I think it's a, the simple answer. It's a very positive step forward um, for a number of reasons. This election, as the ambassadors eloquently described, was a legitimate competitive election. In fact, there were two rounds, which hasn't happened since Montenegro's independence. Um, it was an election where the winner uh, had a landslide victory with 70% of people voting with almost, you know, 60% victory and the losing candidate stepped down. So there was a peaceful transition and the Montenegrin people spoke very loudly that they want to change. We all say that on 24th of February, the world changed, Europe changed and the Western Balkans need to reform. Well, here we go. We have Montenegro changing, and it's a generational change as well, which many countries all over the world could be quite envious of. You have this enthusiastic new leadership, right? Um, and I hear you on various interesting connections. I'm a diehard optimist, but I also would not like to sound naive here. I understand there are vested interests. I understand that it's a very <coughs> ambitious agenda that the new president uh, uh, would be implementing. But I also don't want to prejudge because we have the parliamentary elections coming up and let's see how the parliamentary elections are going to go, what the outcome is going to be, how the new government would be formed and judge them by their actions. Um, I represent here the National Endowment for Democracy and we partner not just with uh, colleagues from IRI, but we have direct partners with civil society and independent media. And so we hear directly from them and trust me, many of them are skeptical. They are tired. They had huge promises a few years ago, and some of these promises have not been fulfilled. So that, in fact, to me, is a source of hope, because I'm sure that civil society, independent media in Montenegro, are going to watch very carefully what the new government is go going to do, and, and rightfully so. At the same time, they're ready to be constructive partners. And I very much hope that the new government, uh, in whatever format that may be, would find ways to engage civil society in order to implement this very ambitious agenda. And just to conclude on the question of instability and the long term, etc., cetera, um, I'd rather not focus on stability that much. Some would argue that the Balkans have been stuck in unstable stability for a long time. And let's go back to the European values, not just op opening chapters. Yes, it, you know, legislative change is necessary. Democratic institutions are important, but let's think about the values of the European Union. And, you know, going back to Article 2 of the Lisbon Treaty, it talks about support to human, to human rights, including rights of minorities, um, dignity, democracy, rule of law, liberty. So I would just advocate that when we talk about stability, we always talk about democracy and stability or peace and democracy. And I'll stop. Thank you so much. Um, over to you, Mr. Magazinovic, Bosnia and Herzegovina, who, as we mentioned, got its candidate status, well, mostly because of geopolitics. Uh, but the high representative is still needed to form a government in one entity, and the president of the second entity openly wants to join another country. And then we also have a situation where members of the presidency discuss the necessity to increase the number of uh, EU4 troops in the country. One say because of the security situation, the other says no, there is no need for such thing. Um, in circumstances like this, is EU accession process even a viable topic? Is it number one on the priority list? So much questions in one question. Yeah. So I will try to tackle them all. Uh, status of candidate. Our government work very hard and fulfill all our ob obligations and we get status of candidate. How does it sound? Good. Great, but it's not true. <laughs> we, we get status of candidate because of, as you said, geopolitics. So we did, we did not do our homework. And the uh, status of candidate is not a word for the politicians that did their job. 
it's the result of the, definitely it's result of the aggression in Ukraine. And uh, we could say that Mr. Putin speeding up EU and NATO integrations in a, in a, in a region. And it's not first time. Uh, a few years ago, uh, there was military parade in Belgrade. I don't know, do you remember that? And Putin was present there. Just a few days after, uh, Bristol announced the new approach to Western Balkan. Fast track because of that, where that document was before. And uh, in the same time, status of candidates sending, it's good for the country, but sending very uh, wrong message to politicians. Because uh, Brussels are not so tough with the preconditions for, for us. Uh, I will give you two examples. It's the same with the NATO. Uh, precondition for SAA, Stabilization and Accession Agreement, was to change our constitution. And uh, it was three years long process which failed at the, at the end. And what was happened? We got SAA. Did we do our homework? No. Okay. When we speak about NATO, precondition for MAP, membership action plan, was to posting prospective military property on the state. Did we do our homework? No. Did we get MAP? Yes. And uh, what is conclusion for most of the politicians? You just need to be patient. And we will get everything without doing our homework. And I think that we need to change that way of thinking. Being a little bit tougher with the task that domestic politicians need to do. You mentioned Hirep and he's helped in the, in the process of forming of government. Uh, he didn't help. He create mess because uh, after the election polls are closed on that Sunday in October last year, he improved new election rules. There is no logic, there is no need for that. But we are country of where everything is possible, including changing the rules of the election after election is finished. And uh, election polls are closed uh, about seven in the evening and he announced his decision about nine. And demolish everything, explaining that that is good for the country because he will deblockade forming of government. Actually, he introduced new rules for or tools for blockade. And his last decision is just trying to fix some things. And I'm not satisfied with uh, that solution. But yes, finally, government is formed in a case that he didn't touch anything governments would be formed in just a few days after election. And uh, since I am already speaking more than five minutes, uh, I will just try to, to send some messages. First one is values. There is no negotiation about values. And when we speak about international community in Bosnia and Herzegovina, there is differences. Europeans in Bosnia, they, they start to be, be uh, they are balkanized and ready to negotiate about values. And right now, uh, some rules that is not acceptable in their own countries are acceptable in Bosnia and Herzegovina, including 
focus on ethnic groups instead of focus on ordinary persons, citizens. And uh, I'm not Eurosceptic. Euro no, I'm one of those that are promoting European integration as a tool uh, for the country to change ourselves, to have better institutions, more functional. But I have problem with the negotiation about values. Uh, with the Americans, you can agree or not, but you cannot uh, negotiate about values. And uh, I will speak a little bit more later about that. Okay. Uh well, a country where anything is possible sounds like a really good slogan, but not in the sense that you pictured for us. Um, Ms. Pishevich, of, of possibilities, yes. Uh, Ms. Pishevich, we mentioned stability and democracy a lot during this panel. Uh, has stability been prioritized by the West at the expense of functional democracy in the Balkan region? Uh, and is the US and EU support in this context um, adequate and sufficient is it doing too much you know stop doing so much for us <laughs> before we start doing the the work ourselves thank you yasmina and and i really want to thank iri for this wonderful opportunity to be here again this year again at a critical time or any time is critical for for the balkans but really to tackle some of the most important issues facing each of the countries and, and region of the whole. And I'd really like to say how heartened I was by, by the prime minister's words about his determination to fight corruption as the main problem in Montenegro. And not only his words, but also seeing his deeds and his acts as really doing what he's saying. And also by ambassadors' passionate support for these efforts, which I think is really important and, and something that we don't see in all parts uh, of the region. Now, saying that after the, the wars, the conflicts in the 90s, I think both US and, and EU rightly placed their focus on stability and security. After the invasion on Ukraine, this became even more prominent and urgent because of the fear of, of uh, Russian uh, uh, influence, because of the risk of overspill uh, of the conflict. And this was necessary, obviously, and still is. However, talking about the other part of it, the democratic principles, fight for democratic rights, for the rule of law, courts, prosecutors, for free institutions, for, for fight against, against uh, cronism, nepotism, corruption, you name it, you cannot end this list easily. That somehow fell in the second category, it seems, because Russian influence seems to be the priority eliminating Russian influence from the region. I'm talking more about, about Serbia now. Now, as a part of the focus on stability and uh, uh, security, we often see nourishing strong central authorities in the countries. And as we all know, you know, support for the authoritarian rulers really erodes democracy because it concentrates the power in the hands of the few. And that becomes the fertile ground for all those things that I've mentioned now. And, you know, unlike what uh, Prime Minister Abazo said about the most biggest gain is the absence of fear today to really do things, to, to say things. We don't see that in Serbia. And so this is something where I believe the, the US and the EU, uh, not necessarily in that order, but you know, there's a perception that it's always the, the US are the ones who have to do things in order to make a difference in our part of the world. This is where I think that there's a need to really re re evaluate that approach. 
and never to turn a blind eye of these other things. Because focusing on only exclusively stability and security uh, can bring some quick gains, but it cannot achieve a sustainable society and even sustainable stability because the kind of discontent grows inside the society. And as we all heard, unfortunately, some of those things, a terrible, horrible shooting that, that happened in Belgrade is, in my view, a manifestation of that. You know, that, that boiling out that someone said it's, a, it's like society is like a pressure cooker. And then it, it just explodes in, in such, an, such a horrible way as, as we have witnessed. So, you know, the, the, the measurements show that. It's not something that there are rumors happening. We see a constant decline, the Freedom House reports, rule of law index, report without borders. Media is, again, the problem that Montenegro doesn't have. You know, media has enormous problems and in this part of the world. And so this is something that really needs more of the US and EU focus and more of the pressure on a daily basis. It's not enough just to say, yes, we acknowledge that things can be done and those who are responsible can be named and journalists have to be protected and have to be safe to do their work and to tell the truth. And that's where I think there is there is a place, there's a, a room for that. It's not too late, luckily, but I think it's something that has to be re-evaluated re on a daily basis in order to really help this society. Because without doing that, uh, uh, our Western allies lose their own credibility in the countries. Some of that that even has been talking about, you know, if we don't feel that there's support for human rights, for freedoms, for basic rights, you know, if there's not insisting that institutions are functional and doing their work. And when I say institutions, I don't mean only government, family is an institution, court is an institution, every hospital is an institution. Those are the places, whole educational system, those are the places that need to be strengthened and that really need to have their independence and the way to do what they were designed for and to make each citizen feel secure that in their country they will be able to get justice in the court. So in the daily life of every citizen, that is where the values and, and, and the, the most key issues should be uh, first installed and resolved. I, I really firmly believe that, yeah. and I, th I think we all feel craving for that kind of engagement from our Western allies. From the ground up. Thank you so much. Uh, this was the first round of our questions. I would like to now open the opportunity for our audience to ask a question, if there is any. We have our microphones ready, so please. Hello, uh, my name is Dan Shainovich. I'm a journalist from Nezavisne Novin from Banja Luka and a member of Task Force IRI. So I have a question for Sasha. Let's imagine um, uh, Mr. Dodi comes to the international community and says, OK, I'm going to give up on Russia. I'm going to um, expedite NATO uh, path to Bosnia and Herzegovina, but you have to let me have this criminalization law, which is now a big issue in Republika Srpska. Let me have this registration of the foreign agents and all these other things that he wants to have. What would be the response of the international community? Would they be really willing to, to make compromise or would they really stick to the, to the values? Because I think it's a core question. What can we expect in, I mean, he's not going to do it for various reasons, but if he did, what do you think you know the internationals, you meet them often, so what would be their response? Thank you. Okay, when we speak about Mr. Dodik, uh, we already know that uh, international community, community are not sticking to the values when uh, negotiate with him. Because there is proof from the previous time that a lot of things is allowed to him to do. But if we speak about NATO, I, I think that there is huge difference 
uh, between press statements when we have cameras around and uh, those things that people are think, thinking about that. I will tell you a story about three leaders in, that are against that. First one said that uh, NATO accession is a process that is done and it's a question of time when we will become NATO state. And he's against when cameras are around. Uh, second one said that, of course, that he need to say that he is against, but since he have a son, he doesn't want to see his son going to war. And of course that he is supported, but if he says that openly, publicly, that, that that will be and for his political career and for his political party. And the third one, uh, just a little story, a uh, group of Bosnian politicians sitting in a hotel lobby in, in Brussels, I think, and uh, one of them get opinion poor research. One of the questions is support for the NATO. In that moment, it was on a historical minimum in Republika Srpska. And uh, of course, that is a reflection of the position of politicians and the messages that they are sending to publicity. And one of them said, we don't care for opinion or research. When we decide to become a member of the NATO, we will change this number in 15 days. And that's the story about NATO in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and I don't need to remember you, but maybe for those that doesn't know that, the, the most serious uh, improvement in Bosnia and Herzegovina after the war, most serious reform, it's reform of army. Three armies that was in, in fight during the war, become one hour. Who finished that job? I could help. Help you, it's not EU. So this is huge reform and uh, those that are claiming that they are against Americans, against NATO, was leaders of that process. And at the end of the day, when we speak about NATO, Presidency of the Bosnia and Herzegovina unanimously take decision that membership in the NATO is one of our priorities. Then we in the Parliament adopt defense law, which is very clear that we want to be member of the NATO. And it was unanimous. Those that are claiming that they are against vote in favor. So it's not decision of the high representative, it's decision of the presidency of the country and parliament of the country. What I'm hearing is, and here's a, a proposal, we should put everyone in an elevator with hidden cameras <laughs> and ask them to speak honestly. <laughs> and then we will deal <laughs> with a lot of these open issues and problems. Is there another question from the audience? I see two hands, please, can you give the mic? Gentlemen, two rows behind will be the second one. My name is Stefan Vladisalev, Program Coordinator of the Foundation BFP, I'm also a member of IRI Task Force. I have two really short questions. One I would like to direct to Ms. Ivancha. Uh, we are talking about uh, emerging cracks in the Euro-Atlantic consensus with the Western Balkans. But let's take a one step back and talk for a second about the stance and the uh, Euro-Atlantic consensus between the Euro-Atlantic partners right now. We have heard just recently conflicting positions, for example, on China questions coming from Emmanuel Macron. Uh, EU seems to have a little bit different position towards China right now than the US has. So how do you see uh, the state of the Euro-Atlantic consensus as it is right now and how it can be developed down the road? It looks like that it still didn't got recovered from the heat that it got over couple of years before the current administration in the US. The second question, really short for Mr. Vevoda, 
it seems that um, in Serbia especially support that is going towards Russia, for example, is not per se support for Russia. It is more anti-Western narrative that we still have a West seen as our enemy in some, some way. So do you see down the road going it more as a developing more as a changing towards more positive perception towards the West? or maybe even substitu substituting Russia with other anti-Western actors like China, possibly. Thanks. Before you start to answer, I will just remind you that we have, well, 12 more minutes, maybe 10 more minutes, uh, until the next big thing in our agenda, which is lunch break. So, <laughs> <laughs> so try, to, try to keep it uh, short, please. Absolutely. I think this is a really large question that would take another panel. I think you did point out two real cracks there that are a challenge for the Transatlantic Alliance, and it has its implications on the Balkans. But I just would give you my quick personal take on this, that I think uh, there's more transatlantic unity than ever before, and it's simply a result of Russia's full-scale invasion of Ukraine. And as you well know, um, Brussels kind of woke up and uh, there was consensus among the 27 members with all the sanctions. And that was done in incredibly coordinate, coordinated way with the US. Um, and that support and that unity is critical um, for uh, the outcome of the war. Um, but I hear you also on the multiplicity of voices. I mean, even when it comes to the EU and the five member states that don't recognize Kosovo, unlike others, and I hear this also from our civil society partners, that it is a challenge for the Western Balkans because the European Union doesn't speak with one voice and donors come to a country even and they present different opinions. So this is more a recommendation, I think, to high level policymakers in Brussels and Washington. But thank you for the question. I'd just like to add to what Asia has said that I think that the, the Russian invasion has provoked a, a renewed strength in transatlantic uh, community, Europe realizing that uh, it cannot go to war or, or support without the United States military. So there's been a rethinking, which doesn't mean that Europe shouldn't try and build its own military capacities. But uh, to, to Stefan's question, I think that uh, several things. One is the uh, what, what is termed in these opinion polls as Serbia's support for Russia. I, I would say it's superficial, and I take my cue from what Sasha Magazinovic has said. You know, when the doors are closed, the discourse is different, and people say, and I agree. In fifteen, in two to three weeks, you can change it. And I take my example, which I cite quote very often is that when Montenegro, or rather Milo Djukanovic, decided to break off from Milosevic in 97, that is the day that Montenegro in public opinion broke away from, from Milosevic. Or when Montenegro decided to go to NATO, that swung the, the votes uh, to the, the public opinion towards. Or you, know, or you have the other example, when you take real, real leadership, right? that and we need to mention it the, the bravery of uh, greek and Mas north macedonian prime minister tsipras and uh, zaev who went a, fully against their majority public opinions there were hundreds of thousands of greeks in the streets against the deal and also in skopje and other towns so if you want to look over the hill as they did and say my goodness well first of all Greece finally overcame its 27 years of blocking North Macedonia, thank God. Uh, but then you had someone on the other side, okay, we'll, we'll sacrifice something. And that's what compromise is about. And that's what I would like to see between Serbia and Kosovo. For goodness sake, we live, if not together, side by side. And I would love our leaders to come shake hands and sit down and say, we have a tough job. There's nothing simple about this. Let's see where we can slowly approach that middle ground, famously where no one is happy, but no one is totally dissatisfied. And so on the, on the as I said, our Serbia society is a pro-Western society. You ask the pro-Russian question, do you like Putin or 
you like Russia. Yes. You ask the next 10 questions. It's all Western. Where do you go for holiday? Where would you send your kids? What movies do you watch? What books do you read? Uh, what cars do you buy? No one's buying a Moskvich, as someone said in Belgrade recently. Uh, and I, I think that's, that's the real test of, of the situation. But because the leaders are creating this confusion and that's their responsibility and have these tools in the tabloids, and state-run media where they fuel this, uh, I would call retrograde language and allow these some, you know, former indicted war criminals, etc. That then, the, unfortunately, it's pensioners mostly. And the other thing that we need to mention there, we have a catastrophic demographic situation in the whole region. You know, we talk about the Western Balkans in 18 million. No, we're not. We're below 16 million now. West, Western countries. Right. <laughs> I mean, so, Bosnia, yeah. they say, is under 3 million now. Yeah. Uh, Macedonia lost 250,000. Mm -hmm. Serbia, officially, from the last census, lost uh, 800,000 people. Realistically, Serbia is around 6 million now. So that these are the real challenges. And as the prime minister rightly said, this is a huge issue for all of us that we need to tackle because, you know, someone's going to turn off the light, the last one that leaves. And as our friend Ivan Krastev says, this changes the political arena because the electorate is becoming older. And of course, older people, usually, I don't want to generalize, are more conservative. We had one question at the back. Are there any more questions? We have uh, five, six uh, minutes more, maybe to, let, to collect all the questions, if there are some common ground to answer them in bulk. So please ask your questions, and then we will let you ask the question. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Alexander, and I'm a um, member of the third Alpi generation from Serbia. And I ha have a question for Mr. Uh, Vejvoda. You uh, mentioned earlier that if we hold a referendum in Serbia to today, the majority would be for the joining the EU. But also, if we hold a referendum on the, the topic of Serbia's uh, Serbia's uh, saying yes to the independence of Kosovo and Metohija, the ma majority would say no. So how do we overcome that uh, political and so societal uh, uh, deadlock? Thank you. We'll just collect two more questions and then we'll answer it. Uh, Paul McCarthy with the IRI. Thank you very much for the excellent panel. Great to see a lot of friends here. Um, I'm, an, a, I'm an optimist as well, but one thing that I'm losing hope on is the Serbia-Kosovo dialogue, as we call it. And increasingly, that seems to me a dialogue of the deaf. Uh, and I think we're losing uh, the thread. There was an article in the Financial Times about this. And my question has to do with um, what more, because we're talking about Euro-Atlantic consensus, what more can uh, Washington and Brussels do to get this process moving? Because I think there's a feeling now that there have been a lot of talks, but now is the time for action. What does that action look like? Uh, where do we need to be doing more on the official level? What can we be doing on the unofficial level as well on this? Now, I understand this is probably a topic for a whole other panel, but I, we need to um, ask it because it is one of, it's the major unresolved issue, which is really um, creating a drag on regional progress. Thank you. Did I see another hand in the air or are these two questions? One more, okay? We will take one more and then we will start answering. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, I am Blian from Republic of Kosovo. And I wanted to ask a question for uh, Mr. Jelal Svechlo. Uh, is there any influence that it's coming outside of our country uh, that is uh, provoking our uh, <laughs> safe and well-being, happy living life with other communities? Because I come from civil society and here I am from IRI and I would like to introduce my colleagues here. Uh, we, uh, we are uh, 
a group of young people from Western Balkan youth partnership in this program. And I would like to hear from you if, yeah, how can we manage that, that thing? Because if we youth are ready to uh, collaborate with each other and we are living in a happy environment, but what is happen, happening outside of it, outside of our country? Okay. So we have Serbian Kosovo questions. Uh, maybe is there a way with that? I yeah. think. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Alexander, for your question uh, on that. Indeed, that, that is an important uh, issue because the European Union, since the beginning of Serbia's accession, has said that uh, the European Union will never take in a country like Cyprus anymore, one that has an unresolved territorial issue. And of course, now that applies to Moldova, because of Transnistria, applies to Ukraine, because of Crimea, and Georgia, of course, because of Abkhazia and South Ossetia. But let's not go too far. Um, for me, one of the most revealing uh, public opinion poll uh, answers and questions in in, for Serbia is the question, would you go and fight for Kosovo? 83% said no. I don't have time. Sorry? I don't have time. <laughs> I don't have time. Yeah. Yeah, so that, that's the real sentiment, okay? Yes, Serbia is also uh, the, the monasteries, the history, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is where leadership is required to explain to people what this is all about, that rights of the Serbian community will be protected and other communities of the Serbian Orthodox Church, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. We have a zillion European examples. We've mentioned them all and studied them all from Northern Ireland to South Tyrol to Schleswig-Holstein to you name it. And so it's a question of our leaders sitting down and saying, OK, what on the shelves of these um, solutions can we use in this particular case? I mean, this is not rocket science, right? And so um, I, I can tell you, I was part of a back channel 15, 16 years ago that had only one meeting with the Kosovo counterpart. This person told me then after the meeting, I won't go into the details because this was diplomacy, right? And that person said to me, look, and this is 15 years, they said, we are ready to do any deal on the North provided it's not partition. Okay, this was one conversation. Never happened again. As these things happen, they peter out. There were other back channels. So we know what the coordinates of this solution are. We need leadership like Tsipras and Zayev to actually bite the bullet and say, OK, let's go over the hill and try and find a solution that will bring a real stability. I mean, let alone the fact that the trade between Serbia and Kosovo is enormous. It's in the millions, right? Businesses are thriving there in good and not so good ways. Uh, we know about that as well, but I, I will uh, conclude by uh, by saying that all of these countries have not changed their strategic goals. All Western Balkan countries want to join the European Union. Nobody has signed anything on the dotted line. No, we're not going to Europe or to NATO, except Serbia, of course. But Serbia has more military exercises with NATO or rather with the Ohio National Guard that is responsible for the relationship 10 times more than with Russia. OK, but that doesn't get the news. The one with Russia gets the news. NATO is in Kosovo, 4000 troops. The Western military is in, in Bosnia. So we are not only surrounded, the West is inside us. And so you only need to look at the map. And I suggest one does that, does that every morning to remind you. Russia will do everything to exert a spoiler effect. And if we allow it, it will continue. But Russia knows as well as we do that this belongs to the Western Alliance. And Mr. Svechlia, uh, I gave you first the word and now maybe to conclude everything and to answer the questions, you have, well, three minutes. Well, the we are hungry. Answers so. are <laughs> so much complex. And we need more, more than three minutes. I know. Let's, uh, let's but, try to be concise. Yeah. Uh, absolutely. Uh, maybe I will continue uh, uh, 
what the last speakers uh, talked about dialogue. Uh, we have the last agreement before this in Ohrid and Washington, it was in 2015. Mm -hmm. uh, why it wasn't implemented? Well, uh, because neither side was interested, especially Serbia. I was told in one closed meeting uh, from a very senior politician from Serbia uh, that give us a north and with the rest you do whatever you want. So partition was uh, actually the goal that Serbia had or Vucic uh, had for seven, eight years. It wasn't uh, the improvement of situation of uh, uh, citizens in Kosovo, especially of the Serbian ethnicity, since that they proclaim that they're interested for that, or uh, historic sites or whatever, it was a territory. The moment that uh, Vucic recognized the fact, acknowledged the fact that there will be no partition, then they switched into uh, rights of uh, community uh, with the aim of um, um, keeping Kosovo dysfunctional as much as possible. They think uh, that they gain through this, most probably some circles in Serbia do, but also what I can, uh, what I can identify as a, their approach is this transactional uh, politics. So not only with Kosovo, but also with the EU. And it's not only uh, Serbia. And I think this is wrong. Uh, democracy is not a goal, it's a journey, they say. So instead of fulfilling uh, the system of values, and through this we improve situation in our societies, uh, there are governments that hope that something will happen abroad and then they will benefit from it. Well, now some countries they're benefiting from, yes, well, uh, some countries they hope that they will benefiting from misbehavior of Russia. Or it was mentioned before, whenever there is an external threat, then they see to kind of uh, this very uh, pragmatic behavior of EU institutions. I'm different. Uh, I have different vision in politics. I think that we set up the goals and benchmarks and then we fulfill them, just like we did with visa liberalization. And unfortunately, it was a political decision that Kosovo remains the last for, for uh, late actually for, for decade and more. What we need to do is really set up democratic rules of engagement and then we compete as countries to fulfill them and then to get uh, carrots because there are so many uh, mentioning of carrots but uh, as a transactional then uh, that's not a the proper way, I think uh, we need to have a stick to for countries, not that disagree, but that doesn't fulfill the benchmarks for democratiz the democratization of societies and uh, countries, which, which means yeah. strictly merit-based. Politics as it should be. So thank you, Mr. Well, I'm uh, yeah. idealistic to be a yeah. politician, but I will jealously Stick to it. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, thank you to all our panelists. We raised, uh, raised some important questions. I hope you got some of the uh, answers. Thank you all so much. Uh, thank you for your questions and your attention. Now, the next big, big thing, as I already said, is, is lunch break. Uh, please enjoy your lunch, but please be back by 1.45. The program continues with one-on-one -on -one with the president-elect of Montenegro. You will want to hear what he has to say. So thank you very much.
Hello. Hello. Hi, this is Tom Keating. Hi, Tom. I was asked to dial in at this time to check technology. Yeah, me too. Ah, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't, let me just email Anissa. So you're not there in person either? No, I am on the East Coast of the U.S., so it's 7 a.m. here. Oh, congratulations. I don't know where you're... <laughs> uh, well, no, I'm calling... I should have been there, but I um, I was, I was, took the week off last week to go cycling in Italy, and I uh, managed to... My first week off for a very long time, and what did I do in, on the flight on the way out there or in the airport? I don't know where. I picked up COVID, so I... Oh, by the end of the week, I was not feeling at all well, um, mm. testing positive. Uh, so, yeah, irritating, but there we go.
Yeah, it was, uh, we, I couldn't make anything line up here other than this conference. So, and I just came back from Korea two weeks ago. So right. okay, that's a... not excited, uh, you know, I, I would always be excited to go to, to Montenegro, but um, it's, it's just too much to travel. <laughs> I, have to, I have to be selective. Yes, no, quite right. Um, well, I can confirm I can hear you, so the line is good. You can hear me, so we can tell them that our audio is good. The cameras, yep. we can't switch on, so yep. Yep. We're, doing, we're doing our own tech check, tech check here. Yeah. Email Vanessa, but uh, maybe she'd gotten back to me within five minutes of my email prior this morning, so. Okay, let's see what happens. I think they all have a break right now. Um, yeah, I think it's lunch, yeah? Uh, yeah, yeah, lunch. Uh, so do, do, do lunch, 12.30 to 1.45. So that started 35 minutes ago. Mm-hmm. I can see somebody on stage. 
Yes, I noticed that uh, we're sort of clearing, <laughs> clearing the cups and the glasses and stuff. Ah, oh. someone's getting a briefing. You're going to sit. You're going to sit there, sir. Okay, that's uh -huh. fine. Who's going? To, and then they'll be sitting there. Um, we've made sure that your arch enemy. No, your arch enemy is sitting there, as or maybe a bit more to the right. Yeah, no, no problem. <laughs> okay, okay. He, he won't be able to stand up. That's fine. No, he'll stay seated. But he will be giving you bunny ears the whole time. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. okay. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Yeah. Thanks. No problem. No. The, the lunch is next door. Yeah, no, next door. Back at 12.45. Okay. <laughs> okay, well. And... I'm going to do this another five minutes, and then I'm going to drop off, because I have yeah. to... Yeah, well, ditto. I think as wrangle, I say, wrangle children and oh, bad luck. Get them off to school. So, and Tom, your your panel is at three p.m. Well, I mean, my time. Uh, three p.m. Oh, here we go. Anessa, we will let you in in a minute. Uh, hmm. well, we're already in. We're in. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, the, yeah, we're on the same panel, you and I. Okay, um, okay. We're on the same panel at 1500 uh, local time. And then, yeah, then two. Okay. Hello. Hello. No. Nope. Can't hear us. Jedan, jedan. Ja mislim da se ja ču. A, jel me čuju oni? Guys, could you please unmute yourselves? Yes. Okay, we can hear Tom. 
We Hello? can hear Eric. Good. Can you can you try your uh, video? It says you cannot start your video because the host has stopped it. Okay, let us solve that. Moraš negdje u settingsima. Ja mislim da imaš. Still the same message. Yep. Yes, we are trying to sort it on our end. Okay. We're here with the technicians, so just a couple of minutes, let us figure out. We can hear you perfectly, but let us just figure out the cam part. We can also hear you well, so that's great. Good. Are you able to see us? Yes, can see you the close shot on you at the moment. Good. You're holding a red iPhone, just to confirm. <laughs> that's me, that's me. <laughs> How are you feeling, Tom? Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I didn't feel great on Friday and Saturday. Yesterday was uh, better, and today, yeah, foggy, I think, is the technical medical term. Yeah, very <laughs> sorry that that happened. Yeah, well, you know what, if you go on holiday, then this is the punishment. Yeah. That's what my boss always says, you know, that holidays are overrated. Yes. Well, I'm going to use this as an important example to my, my team. So uh, you, if you want, you can mute yourselves. Just give us a couple of minutes to figure out the video and I'll let you know. Okay. I'm still listening. Okay. Thanks. Sounds good. Uh, možeš li otići u uh, cijeli sastanak preko desktop verzije možda? E, možda tu da pogledamo. Aj sačka, sad ću ja doći. <laughs> 